Welcome to the Beamsville Church of Christ video ministry. Services are presented on YouTube, Facebook, and our website one week following recording. Scripture quotations marked NIV, taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, NIV, copyright 2011 by Biblica Inc., used by permission, all rights reserved worldwide. The scriptures marked NET are from the Net Bible, netbible.com, copyright 1996, 2019, used with permission from Biblical Studies Press, LLC, all rights reserved. We are currently recording services in accordance with provincial lockdown regulations. If you would like to contribute a scripture reading, prayer, or communion thoughts, please send a message through Facebook or an email to adam.sandiford at beamsvillechurchofchrist.ca. This week's sermon is titled, Admitting Need. Thank you to John and Jeff for your participation. The scripture reading to prepare our minds is Psalm 121, verses 1 to 8. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's good to meet together with you online and with those who are gathered here in person. Thank you for, uh, for being present. Thank you for your ongoing prayers for our congregation and the people in our congregation. We uh, ask that you keep us always in mind and that if you have any needs at all, reach out to us and, and we'll see how we can support you. As we begin our time of worship this morning, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, as we are coming to you with people all around the world, different times, different places, different situations, we know that you are the great uniter. We have one faith, one hope, one God, and that's you. We ask for your comfort, for the people who are suffering greatly at this time through emotional problems, through physical problems, financial problems. We ask that you show us how we can support them and that we have the courage to do so and that they have the courage to ask. Please bring us together with your body everywhere around the world. Help those who are isolated to know that they are not alone, that you are with them, and that we are with them as well. Please bless our time together this morning. Please bless those who have prepared ideas. Give them sharp memories to to pull those to mind. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who interprets when words are not enough. Thank you most of all for your son Jesus, the one who brings us together, gives us a reason to be one. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for tuning in. We're glad that we can be together, even through virtual ways these days, but we're delighted that you are with us and hearing this message today. A prayer to be said when life is burdensome and it seems all of life is against you and you are exhausted physically and emotionally and you're too tired to pray, and you have so much to do, and no time to do it, here is the prayer. Dear Lord, help. And there are great characters in scripture who prayed those prayers, help. And I wanna read a story that's uh, not a real common story, but it's a unique story. Moses is the character in this story, and it's found in Exodus chapter 18. Now, Jethro, and this is where I stop to say this is not Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies. Now, Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. 
Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and I'm going to be skipping verses. I'm in verse 5 now. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the desert where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So I just stopped to make the point that you remember the story of Israel being in captivity for so, so many years. And Moses is called to lead the children of Israel into a promised land. And that, of course, took a long time. So there's some unique and wonderful and interesting stories in, in all that time span from the time they leave until eventually they settle. And this is a unique story. And this is all about admitting need that we all need help. And no matter how capable we are with our occupations or with anything else, we all need help. It's not weakness. We all need help. So here's the story. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the desert where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. This would be so interesting to hear what happens, what exactly was being said. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all about the hardships they had met along the way, and how the Lord had saved them. That would have been a long conversation. Jethro was delighted to hear all about the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 13. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. So again, picture this if you will. Hundreds of thousands of Israelites, all having needs, all needing answers, all needing disputes settled, all needing advice, all needing help. And here was Moses alone, trying to make these decisions by all of these people. So picture in your mind how many people would be gathered around wanting Moses' advice, needing his help. And verse 14 says that Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, when he saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening. Moses couldn't catch his breath. And Moses answered, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me. And I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. Maybe Moses thought, you know, I've got the responsibility for doing this. Jethro says, this is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. And then later it says, you must be the people's representative before God 
and bring their disputes to him. And then in verse 21, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring the very difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. And if you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Really an interesting story and good advice. Moses was, as you remember, in constant communication with God. But you and I aren't Moses. However, you and I can be in constant communication with God just by speaking to him. And how many times in scripture are we reminded that God speaks to us and tells us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am always with you. God knew us before we were born. It's a beautiful reality of our life. I love the story of a monk living in a monastery. You may know the story, Brother Lawrence. He took the vow of silence as he started as a monk. And he labored in the kitchen. He would work all day in the kitchen, providing food and nourishment for the monks. So from very early in the morning until late at night, he worked in the kitchen, taking a vow of silence. He never talked, but he never stopped talking. He never verbalized out loud any word, but in reading the history, if you watch Brother Lawrence cutting carrots or whatever, his mouth was always going, always speaking, always talking without anyone ever hearing it because it was quiet, it was silent. And someone once asked him, Brother Lawrence, what, what do you say? And he said, what, what do you mean? Well, you're working in the kitchen all day long. You're serving the monks and you're, you're obviously talking to someone. And he looked at them and said, well, you should know the answer to that. I'm talking to God. God is with me 24 hours a day. I'm in constant communication. And let's face it, you and I, 24 hours a day, are in communication with God. Now, we're not speaking to him all the time, but he's with us. We know that there are times in life that are really difficult. Some people are having a really difficult time right now, but you can talk to God. God hears us. God speaks to us. God whispers oftentimes to us. He gives us advice, not just through scripture, but knowing how he works in our lives. Constant communication with God. And that's why we have so many scriptures about prayer. In fact, when you read the Bible, you wonder, well, why are we always talking about prayer? Because it's a constant reminder to communicate with the one who created us, loves us, saves us, ongoing work in us. It would be very, very strange if the people we love the most, we never talk to. We communicate, we share our dreams, our hopes. We share with one another. And so Paul will say things like this. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. I love it. It's short, it's brief, it's powerful, it's excellent. Pray continually. Don't stop praying. Pray constantly. Pray continually. Or James 5 and verse 13. If you are in trouble, pray. Just a good reminder. Or in Jeremiah 33, God says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great 
and unsearchable things you do not know. Or in Jude, verse 20, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, meaning God's Holy Spirit takes those prayers, molds those prayers, helps us in those prayers. 1 Timothy 2.8, I want people everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands, earnestly praying, giving ourselves to God in prayer. Or, very sage advice, Romans 12, 12, be faithful in prayer. Just pray. Some of us are early morning people. Some of us are late night people. And I like the early mornings. And I often picture myself, as I drink my coffee in the morning, just talking to God. It's a wonderful experience. I mean, you don't have to always be texting someone. We don't always have to be looking at our phone. We don't always have to be listening to the radio or watching TV. But early morning, and whatever your favorite time of the day is, just spend some time talking with God, knowing that God is with us. If you exercise, whether you're jogging or walking, God's with you. Talk to him. We know as parents, we love it when our children, no matter how old they are, communicate with us, talk to us. God, our loving Father, he wants us to speak to him. He wants us to talk to him. Don't give up praying. This is what Jesus said. He told his disciples that they should pray and not give up. Don't give up praying and don't give up reaching out to others. It's so important. If you are feeling isolated because of this pandemic, if you are feeling abandoned, if you're feeling ignored, and if you feel that no one is reaching out to you and that no one is calling you, there is a 100% guaranteed solution to that problem. Call people. Email people. If you feel like no one is communicating with you, communicate. Communicate with God. Communicate with Christ. Communicate with the Holy Spirit. Communicate with people. Don't wait. Reach out to people. There's no reason to be cut off from people. Just as it's so important to communicate with God, it is important to pray for others. And if you're communicating with someone and if you're talking with them on the phone, pray with them and not just for them. There's multiple ways of communication today. We are so advanced in technology, it is amazing. And we can use all of those means to reach out to people all over the world, especially if you know people who are feeling isolated, who are feeling lonely. Call them, talk to them, and be an encouragement to them. Most of us pray, but then there are others who are prayer champions, prayer warriors. I'm not sure how many years ago, I was trying to remember, and I can't quite remember how many years it was. But as a church, on Wednesday evenings in the summer, we decided that we wouldn't be meeting in the church building, but that we would meet in each other's backyards. It was a lot of fun. And I remember the times when we would pray together. And I'd forgotten about this memory, and then it just kind of dawned on me that I remember one time Barbara and I were living on Ontario Street at that time, and we were hosting the, the church that, uh, that, I guess it was in the evening, on a Sunday evening. And we all gathered together in the backyard, and there was a wonderful couple that lived in town for a few years who were part of our church, Victor and Doreen, and I don't know how many people remember them. And their background was a little different than, than ours, but it was a, 
they're wonderful people, love God with all of their heart. And I remember being in the backyard and, and we just had a big circle of lawn chairs and we just, whoever wanted to pray, prayed and they were good prayers. But when Victor or Doreen prayed, it was an experience. Their prayers were deep. Their prayers were profound. Their prayers had energy. Their prayers were just incredible prayers. I, I've never heard people pray with such conviction and with such need in communication with God. And it was a reminder how important it is to communicate to God and to one another. Prayer warriors are encouragers. Uh, I suppose in the 18th century, two of the most profound gospel preachers at that time would have been Charles Haddon Spurgeon and Dwight L. Moody. And they both encouraged one another. And what's interesting in reading a biography of, of Spurgeon is that he was not really a dramatic uh, preacher. In fact, his, his voice never really got too profound. He just... He was just a, a preacher. But God took those words, and man, it changed so many people's lives. So one day, a person was visiting Charles Spurgeon, and he was preaching uh, at his church like he normally did. He would often preach from a Thursday right through until a Sunday every evening. And the place was crowded with people. And he would just preach in such a way that many, many people came to Christ. And someone asked him, what is it that you do where so many people come to Christ? I'm a visitor, they said, and I, I'm here, and your preaching is fine, but so many people are coming to Christ. Do, do you have a reason for that? He said, yeah, absolutely. I know exactly why hundreds... Thousands of people are coming to Christ. I know exactly why that is. He said, well, tell us. What's the secret? He said, it's not a secret. It's what God always said would happen. He said, what do you mean? He said, the, the reason why so many people come to the Lord is because of my heating plant in the basement. And they were totally confused. A heating plant? Your furnace? No, no, my heating plant. They said, we have no idea what you're talking about. He said, follow me. And so they left the auditorium and they went down to the level. And then they went down to the very bottom of the building, the basement. And they opened up these doors and there were hundreds of men and women on their knees praying before, during, and after the worship service that happened three or four times every day. He said, that's the reason why people are coming to Christ. Prayer. Praying with each other, praying for one another, praying for people to come to Christ. It's a wonderful story that's a true story. That we live in an age of technology, but nothing beats getting down on our knees, no one around, and just talking to God. And I think one of the encouraging things about that is that you can picture God listening to you, just you and him, just talking, just talking to Jesus, just talking to God, just talking. It's communication with God. And in, in this pandemic, where people are isolated and they're sometimes getting a bit cranky and it's very, very difficult, we can pray for them. We can reach out for them. And a reminder that if we ever start moving in that direction, nothing beats just being in communication with God himself. It's just very possible that praying for someone may save their life. It's very possible that praying for someone just may save their life. People can be despondent, they can be hurting, 
They can say, I don't want to be part of this world anymore, but your prayers for them just may change their life. Now, we have a story of this in the Bible, and this will be the last part that I want to share today. And it's a remarkable story. It's the story of Peter, and it's found in Acts chapter 12, and it's a remarkable story. It's a wonderful story. I'll just go ahead and read this to you, and I'm not going to read every single verse, but I'll, I'll just read some of this. It's found in, in Acts chapter 12, 1 through 19. King Herod had arrested uh, some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. They didn't want Christianity in that area. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. So King Herod was against Christianity. He thought he could advance his own ego and his own popularity by getting rid of Christians. So he proceeded to seize Peter. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And after arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. So if you could picture that in your mind. Here is the church gathered together, and they're focused, laser-focused on prayers. And I, I want us to maybe spend some time thinking about that. Here's Peter in prison. They're coming together, and it sounds like what they're doing is they're nonstop praying. It's not, let's have a call, let's gather everyone together. Uh, Don, would you lead this prayer? Dear God, please be with Peter, and if possible, let him escape. Amen, and go home. Mm. This was deep, sweat as it were, drops of blood praying, communicating with God, pouring our heart out to God. Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for Peter. So the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. So you can picture this. You have sentries right by the prison doors. You have Peter inside the prison, plus sentries beside him all locked together. Peter is not going to get out. Well the Lord had other ideas. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared. A light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Peter was sleeping. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. The angels of God were around him. And I'd like us to think that the angels of God are all around us as well, and our loved ones. So in verse 8, it says, The angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision, maybe a dream. They passed the first and second guards, and came to the iron gate leading to the city, it opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left Peter. Now, you have to use your imagination here, I think, because it would be quite remarkable. Peter's thinking, what is going on? What's happening? Verse 11 says, then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, uh, 
the mother of John, who's also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. They were praying for Peter. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Now, before I read the next verse, please remember the church is earnestly praying for Peter. Peter's at the door. They're praying for Peter. Wouldn't you think they would say, oh, great, Peter's escaped. Great, the Lord answered our prayer. What they said was, you are out of your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And they left for another place. It's quite a remarkable story. It is interesting to note that sometimes when we do pray, we don't know the outcome, but we may have just saved someone's life. Right now, people are struggling. It's very difficult for a lot of people for their mental health. Pray. Pray for people. The answer to those prayers may just save their life. So we look at the scriptures and we could read again all these scriptures that we noticed today about prayer. But prayer is so important in communicating with God, helps us to reach out to one another. It's a wonderful story about the fact that we all need to admit that we need help because others have helped us. For those of us who are Christians, we didn't become Christians just by ourselves. We may have had parents, we may have had siblings, we may have had friends who just sat down and explained the gospel to us. But not only that, God's Holy Spirit has been encouraging us from the moment that we were born. That we're not just human beings, but we're people created in the very image of God. And that Jesus came to live for us and living with us. And because of all that, because of all the things that God has poured out into our lives, and I love the scriptures that talk about this, that God pours out his love into our hearts with abundance. And if he does that, can't we accept that and pour it out into the lives of other people? God created us to know him and to love him. And may we be an encouragement in reaching out to others in that venue as well. I hope you have a wonderful week. Keep on loving God, reach out to other people, and know that you just may save someone's life. Amen. My warmest greetings to the church. We come now to the portion of our time we call communion. This is a time in which we normally join together to proclaim to each other that we are one, that we jointly hold to the confession that one man sent by God was willing to pay the price for our rebellion and reconcile us to his and our Father. These are far from normal times, and I miss seeing you and feeling the accord that we would share. Don has spoken about admitting need. This time of breaking bread is the very embodiment of that ideal. We gather to share this simple meal in recognition that we are broken and we need healing. Doing that in a group setting helps us because others around us are joint participants in thanking God that we have Jesus who was willing to answer our needs, whether spoken or only felt, so that we might be pure in God's sight. 
Today, I hope my words will remind you that despite being apart, your brothers and sisters join you and uphold your desire to cast your burdens on Jesus. Not that that's easy. A man by the name of Neil Anderson says this, Confession is not saying, I'm sorry. It's openly admitting, I did it. My prayer for you is that you accept the grace that Jesus has afforded you at Calvary. The writer of the book of Hebrews comforts and exhorts us with these words. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. And so, though these are trying times, our God is faithful, and the sacrifice Jesus made at Calvary was rewarded by his return to a new life with his Father. And that faithfulness continues. It delivers grace to us today and will in the future when we share that same new life with Jesus and his Father and the church of his love. Let's go to him in prayer at this time. Father, we are so thankful that you found a spotless lamb in your son who was willing to take upon him our sins and our transgressions. And Father, we know how difficult it must have been because he cried out just before he died in abandonment because he no longer felt your presence. Thank you that he was willing to go to that degree on our behalf. Thank you, Father, that your power raised him to a new and perfect life. Father, one that can never be assailed by the gates of hell. Thank you that as we break this bread and as we drink from this cup, we are united, though we are separated, and we look forward to the day, Father, when your church will come home, be with you forever. Amen. May you be blessed by God and his Son and his Spirit throughout this week. Because of the provincial lockdown, in-person services are cancelled until further notice. Please check our Facebook page for the most current updates. You can learn more about the congregation at beamsvillechurchofchrist.ca.